Welcome to Real Physics, your channel about the fundamental laws of nature. Let me clarify in the beginning, this is not about a relation of the monster group to string theory, because I believe string theory is hogwash. This is real physics. But nevertheless, what I'm going to talk about is very speculative. And I cannot really claim there is a relation. I'm just communicating a coincidence which is uh, interesting and uh, especially because it's unknown. In case you haven't heard about Dirac's large numbers, I recommend watching the video linked in the description. But to make you catch up, Dirac was wondering about numbers in physics and he noted that the ratio of the electric and the gravitational force in the hydrogen atom was a huge number, 10 to the power of 40, as it is the ratio of the size of the universe to the size of the proton. Additionally, um, there are about 10 to the power of 80 particles in the universe, the square of the former number, and I agree with Dirac, and I think there are good arguments in favor, that this is not just a coincidence, but it reflects a deep connection between atomic physics and cosmology. But what the hell should it have to do with the monster group, which has the order of 10 to the power of 53 elements? And uh, well, in short, I'll show you that this number hides behind those cosmological observations noted by Dirac. And that's all what I have to say. I have no justification whatsoever to claim that there is a connection and even worse, I haven't the faintest conceptual idea how such a relation could be established. But there might be people who know better and like to communicate the coincidence. In any case, it's funny. But now let's get serious. How does this number 10 to the power of 53 show up in cosmology while everybody else believes it's 10 to the 40? As I have mentioned in other videos and in my book Einstein's Last Key, there is an interesting cosmology developed by Robert Dickey in 1957, which actually goes back to a variable speed of light theory in 1911 by Albert Einstein. But let's shortcut here and jump right into Dickey's argument. Light deflection, according to general relativity, requires a refractive index according to this formula, which is dependent on nearby masses. Now, as I said, this is all in agreement with observations, but uh, Dickey makes an interesting suggestion here. He says the uh, right-hand side is a small number related to the gravitational potential of the Sun. Could it be that the one in the equation is related to a corresponding sum over all other masses in the universe? Now, this is a beautiful idea but the concept behind is even more intriguing because it leads to a cosmos in which there is no material expansion of matter, just light that spreads. So the visible part of the universe, we can observe the horizon gets bigger and bigger and the increase in visible mass uh, leads in turn to a decrease of the speed of light that causes the cosmological redshift. Now, of course, all this has to be worked out quantitatively and you're invited to check it in detail, but the bottom line is not that difficult. Now, given that the expansion rate of the universe is the speed of light, another strikingly simple feature of Dick's theory, we consider the formula that relates the speed of light to the gravitational potential of the universe. Einstein's constant kappa is defined here. And so the number of particles in the universe is proportional to the volume to the third power of the radius r. So we end up with r squared proportional to 1 over c squared. And if we look for the temporal evolution, this is a differential equation that has the only solution. Radius is proportional to the square of absolute time. And uh, 
the speed of light is proportional to the inverse square of t. Don't get mad if I introduce an absolute time here because we'll bring back it soon to observational quantities. Now bear in mind that the speed of light is always a product of wavelength and frequency and to be compatible with the observations f and lambda have to decrease with this dependency that means measuring rods contract. Imagine f and lambda concretely as wavelength and frequency of a laser with which you measure everything and uh, if you want to express the size of the cosmos which is proportional to the um, square root of absolute time if you want to express it in local units so you end up with t to the power of three quarters and a little mental arithmetic already gives you a glimpse of what I'm trying to tell you because if t to three quarters is 10 to the power of 40 then t itself has to have a power of about 53 but uh, for the sake of clarity let's introduce some redundancy and take an encompassing look on all the variable quantities now to make it still easier let's consider absolute time 10 to the power of 4 10,000 time steps in arbitrary units the size of the cosmos which is proportional to the square root of absolute time would be 100 while the speed of light has decreased to 100 of its original value. That means that both wavelength and frequencies would have decreased to one tenth, while the time step being the inverse of the frequency would have grown tenfold. So if you measure the actual size of the cosmos, which is 100, but your measuring rod has shrunk to one tenth, you end up with the result 1000. And the same thing with time, because absolute time 10,000 measured with a tenfold increased time step gives the result 1000, conveying the seemingly constant speed of light. Mm -hmm. And as a sideline, it's also nice to see how this explains Dirac's second hypothesis, because if you count the number of particles, which is proportional to the volume, which is proportional to the third power of r, you end up with 10 to the power of 6, 1 million particles. Incidentally, the square of 1000. Now, all what we have to do is to transfer this example of the early universe back to a later stage and replace the number 1000 by 10 to the power of 40 and you realize that absolute time 10,000 would correspond to 10 to the power of 53. To summarize, I think it is fair to say that the observation of the universe combined with the observation of the uh, subatomic particles yields indeed a number of that order of magnitude but um, the entire paradigm, and I mean everything what I explained so far, is based on the assumption that today is not a special moment in the history of the universe. So it really doesn't make sense to relate it to a number coming out from pure mathematics that is certainly a constant. However, there remains the remote possibility, and I discussed that in my latest book, that we fool ourselves with the concept of space and time. We can measure the number 10 to the power of 53 and every cosmologist would assume it's just a random number representing an insignificant moment in the evolution of the history but actually we haven't measured a change of that number either. So if a future genius physicist comes along and proves that time and space are illusions and we always must observe 10 to the 53, then the question arises how do you deduce that number from pure math? And certainly the auto of the monster group would be a good starting point. Um, well, for more on the monster group I recommend Grant Sanderson's video and as I said for me it's just a nice coincidence, keep it in mind in case. Don't forget to like the video if you subscribe, you will hear more about fundamental physics.